All right, everyone. So welcome to uh, the live Q&A for Module 5. Uh, before we get into the homework for Module 5, we'll start like we always do and go through the quiz from the prior module. So on the screen there, you should see the first question, which was for RMC QRA calcs. For the yellow shaded input cells outlined with a red box, the user should. And the correct answer there is paste inputs as formulas. So anytime we had just the simple yellow shaded input cells, we should paste as values. But when those uh, shaded cells are outlined with a red box, the user should paste the input as formulas. So question number two for RMC QRA calcs, which of the following is false? So the maximum stage must be the same for all stage frequency relationships. So when we're inputting things for hydrologic hazard, we've got our fifth percentile, our 50th percentile, 95th percentile, and expected value. Uh, the maximum stage must be the same for all of those stage relationships. So that um, first one there is true. Uh, the reason we need the same maximum stage across is because we that's the only way we'll be able to set a distribution for that stage is to have probabilities for each of those. Um, next, for a given project, the same set of stage partitions must be used for all PFMs. That is also true. So the way the spreadsheets are set up is that when it pulls information from uh, one PFM to the next, it's using the partitions that were set for the first failure mode. So all the same stage partitions need to be the same for all PFMs. And then the third option there is best to clear the simulation results stored in the spreadsheet prior to running a new simulation. That is also true. Um, if you do not clear the simulation results, at risk is going to go through all of the different cells that are calling data, and it really slows down your initial uh, it really slows how long it takes for to initialize the simulation run. So we always want to clear that um, before running the new simulation. And if you remember, we've got we had that uh, column on the left hand side of the screen that would turn red when the simulation data was in there. So that's purpose was to alert you of that. So we always want to clear simulation results before running a new one. So then that solution would be none of the above for question two. So then for question three, true or false, for RMC QRA calcs, when inputting values into the various tables, the stages need to be input from low to high, and that is definitely true. Um, everything's set up to interpolate off of those inputs, and the only way for that interp interpolation macro to work appropriately is to have everything from low to high. And then our last question, true or false, for RMC QRA calcs, the RMC project risk spreadsheet be open to link properly to the RMC risk summary and plot spreadsheet, and that is true. If it's not open, the spreadsheet doesn't know what to find, and it, it, will, it won't link properly. Okay. So any questions on the Module 4 quiz before we move into uh, the Module 5 homework? All right, that quiz should have been fairly simple, straightforward. So I'm going to turn it over to Adam now, and he's going to uh, open up Total Risk and step through the my homework solution. All right, thanks, Damon. I have the Homework 5 spreadsheet open with all of our inputs. For homework five, we were to calculate the project risk using RMC total risk and the data below, applying a common cause adjustment for all three of our potential failure modes, using the specified distributions in the spreadsheet and running 1,000 iterations for a full uncertainty Monte Carlo analysis. So our first step is to open up total risk, which I've already done. And the first thing that we will do is enter our stage frequency relationship. So we're going to 
right click on hazards and add a tabular hazard stage frequency if we look back at our data we are to use a pert distribution for the stage frequency and we are given the minimum most likely and maximum inputs for annual exceedance probability so our uncertainty here is on annual exceedance probability and not on stage so what we will need to do is find the hazard is uncertain checkbox and I'm using a version of total risk that came out last week this is a new beta version so it looks a little bit different than I think what you all had for this course the hazard is uncertain checkbox is now over in the properties window so we uncheck the hazard is uncertain box in our drop down menu for distribution select pert and then we can simply copy and paste the data from excel into total risk and there we see we have our stage frequency curve with our 90 percent confidence interval showing up one thing i want to point out you see that i have an error down here invalid hazard function ordinates but when i look at all my data i don't see any ordinates that are highlighted in red and what i found is that <clears throat> total risk is still a, a little bit buggy we're working through some of these um, some of these bugs so there's there's nothing wrong with the data that we input but in order to get this error to go away what we're going to have to do is save the file close total risk and then reopen it which is kind of a pain but in due time I think we'll get all those issues corrected so when we reopen we see that we still have our stage frequency curve but now we don't have any more errors now Adam this is just for this latest version correct that's correct yes very and good. it's Thank it's you. very possible that the version that that they were working in has other bugs that have been corrected prior to this version so <clears throat> I think if, if you're working in total risk and you come across any little bugs like that, please make sure to write them down and forward them to the um, either the, the training email or to myself and Damon so that we can forward them on to get those fixed. The next thing that we are going to do is build our event trees for system response. Our first potential failure mode is overtopping and that is a four node event tree so we can come back under system response we add event tree response and this is pfm1 overtopping what i like to do is i like to build the event tree structure and set everything up to accept my probabilities before i enter probabilities so i'm going to go ahead and rename this first node node one and looking at my data, I see that I have triangular distributions that are stage dependent for node one, and that holds true for nodes two through four as well. So if I set up node one so that I have a multi-value source and a triangular distribution, and let me take a step back before I even copy and paste these nodes, the first thing I should probably do is assign my hazard levels. So I see that there are six hazard levels for PFM1. And the, the format of the data is different than what total risk requires. These are in rows and total risk requires columns. So all I'm gonna do is copy that data and I'm going to transpose it in Excel so that I can easily copy it and then paste it in. So now I have all my hazard levels. When I open up my node one probability box, I see all those hazard levels populated. Now all I'm going to do is copy and paste until my event tree structure is completely built. I'll rename this one node two, three, and four. Now what we need to do is copy and paste our nodal probabilities for each one of our nodes. So I'm, I'm gonna do the same thing I'm going to copy the data in Excel. I'm going to transpose the data. This is the format that Total Risk wants to see. It wants to see the hazard levels by row and 
lowest reasonable value, most likely value, and highest reasonable value in columns. So now I can simply copy that and paste it directly into total risk. So I do that for node one, node two, and then three and four. Okay, so now I have my nodal probabilities pasted in. This is an overtopping failure mode, so I'm going to be using linear interpolation. In my interpolation transforms, I want to use linear interpolation for my hazard and linear interpolation for my probability. One thing that you can do, and I'll walk through this on PFM1, this is what I like to do, just to make sure that all your inputs are correct in total risk, you can look at the response tab and see what your responses are by, um, by stage. And how I like to do that is you have a triangular distribution for each one of your, your hazard levels and nodes. If you find the expected value of that distribution, oops. Remember the expected value for a triangular distribution is simply the average of the minimum, most likely, and maximum value. And then if I take all of my load levels and I calculate the system response for each one, these should be the expected values for each load level and should match the values that are in RMC total risk. So let's see if we can get these to show up side by side. All right, it's a little bit blurry, so I close those. So now what we can do <coughs> is click on the dashed blue line, which is our mean. It's the same thing as expected value, and we can go stage by stage and make sure that our values line up. So 582.3, uh, I have a conditional probability of 1e e to the minus 16 in total risk, which is 0. For my next one, 8.96e e to the minus 7, 1.28e e to the minus 3, 4.28e e to the minus 2, 4.12e e to the minus 1, and 7.56e e to the minus 1. So now that I've checked that, I'm confident that everything has been entered into total risk correctly. So that's one extra step that you can do to check to make sure that all your probabilities have been brought in correctly. It's something that I like to do, and I would advise you to do that as well, just to make sure. Okay, now we have PFM1. <clears throat> Are there any questions on any of this before I move on to building the other event trees? So one thing real quick, I got a question in via email uh, a week or so ago asking, you know, should we be using linear, should we be using semi-log for overtopping failure modes? And really, I guess the most correct way would be to plot things out, look at the different transforms to see what best approximates the straight line, but in reality, Typically, what teams will do is use linear because overtopping failure modes are always going to have that zero point, which is going to be your um, effective crest elevation. And then the system response curve is usually only going to span a handful of feet. So regardless of what method you use, it's not going to change the results significantly. So we usually take the easy way out and do linear like Adam is showing. So I just wanted to clarify that real quick. Thanks. All right, then we move on to our next failure mode, PFM2, which is backward erosion piping. And this failure mode has eight nodes, but they don't all have um, triangular distributions and they are not all stage dependent. We have some stage independent nodes. Node 5 is a stage independent node. 
And then node six is um, a stage independent node with no probability distribution. So we have to set up our nodes in total risk a little bit differently. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to get all of my hazard levels, just like we did for PFM1, and I'm going to assign those first. And then I'm gonna go ahead and build my event tree as though each node has a triangular distribution and a stage dependent. I find that to be a little bit easier, but as you're working in total risk, you can do it a different way if you would choose. Five. Now I can come back and I can look at each of my nodes one by one to determine what the appropriate relationship and probability distribution is going to be. I know that nodes one, two, and five are stage dependent nodes with a triangular distribution, and node six is stage, I'm sorry, stage independent nodes with a triangular distribution, and node six doesn't have any distribution assigned to it. So I go back to total risk and I say node one, this is a single value because it's stage independent, but I still want a triangular distribution. I do the same thing for node two and node five. And for node six, what I want is a single value, but I want to leave the distribution to deterministic. There's only one value for that node. But for node one, I can enter these values in manually. I can take the time to, to copy and transpose them over here and copy and paste that. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't even need to do that. Let me back up. So for stage um, independent nodes, we have a single value. It does accept the min most likely and maximum value in column format. So I apologize for that. So now what I can do is I can simply copy and paste these values in as they are in the spreadsheet. So node one, node two. And now when I get into node three, that's when I have to transpose the values in Excel to get them in the right format for total risk. I do the same thing for node four. Node five, I can just copy and paste. Node six has a probability of one, so I can manually type in a probability of one for node six. And then nodes seven and eight, we will transpose the data and copy into total risk. That's not what I wanted. There we go. The PFM2 is a backward erosion piping failure mode. So we want to use semi-log interpolation for this failure mode. And my interpolation transforms, I still want linear interpolation for my hazard, which is our stage frequency. And for probability, I'm going to select logarithmic and that will give me my semi-log interpolation. I can also check the response over here just as I did for PFM1. I'm not going to go through the exercise for this one but I would again advise you to do that for each of your failure modes just to make sure that you're pasting everything correctly. And then we have our final failure mode which is PFM3 and the structure of the PFM3 event tree is the same as PFM2. It's an eight node event tree. So we have the option to simply copy PFM2 and rename it as PFM3. 
So now our structure is already built. All we have to do is enter in our probabilities. For PFM3, um, we still have some stage independent <clears throat> nodes with a triangular distribution, stage dependent nodes with triangular distribution, and one node with no probability distribution. So it's just a matter of making sure that, again, all the nodes are set up correctly and all the probabilities are, are pasted correctly. So nodes one, three, four, and five all require single value and triangular distribution. So one, three, four, and five. And I believe it was node six that still had stage dependent deterministic. So node two for PFM three, we need a multi-value triangular distribution. I think that should be all we need to do. So then we copy and paste our data into total risk. And while I'm doing this, did anybody spot what I forgot to do? Nope. Doesn't sound like anybody did. I forgot to change my hazard levels for this PFM from PFM2. So we're evaluating different hazard levels for PFM3. When I copied PFM2, it copied those hazard levels from PFM2. So I need to make sure that I grab the correct hazard levels for PFM3, otherwise my calculations will not be correct. All right. I think that there was something in the chat. Yeah, so Chris uh, put a comment in the chat. He found it helpful to plot the response figure in Semilog to confirm um, which interpolation method is appropriate. That's a great way to do it, Chris. You can go to the response tab and you can change the axis for your system response probabilities. It's by default, it's linear, but you can change this axis, axis by right clicking and formatting the axis. And you can make it linear, you can make it log, or you can make it a normal probability axis. And that can help you figure out which interpolation method is going to give you the best linear result for, um, for your failure mode. So that's a great point. So you can see the difference between log and linear. And then it's up to you to determine which gives you the better straight line and which, which interpolation method best fits your data set. All right, so now we have all three of our failure modes. Are there any other questions or comments before we move on to consequences? Okay, for our consequences, we have life loss <clears throat> and we have economic cost. So we're gonna start by entering our life loss consequences and our prompt is to use a PERT distribution for the breach and the non-breach life loss. And we're given exposures for day and night. 
and data sets for each. So we're going to go under consequences and right click and add tabular consequences. I'm going to name the first one breach life loss underscore day. I find it helpful to have an underscore with day and night, but you can use whatever nomenclature you find um, the most clear. So our distribution for our day breach life loss is going to be a PERT distribution. One other thing that I should mention in the new beta version of Total Risk, you uh, may have noticed that I haven't touched the hazard type and hazard units for any of these functions that I've been entering. With the updated beta version, these are already pre-populated with the most common hazard type and hazard units. So when you create a consequence function, it will automatically populate with stage and feet and life loss and lives. When you enter system response, it'll automatically populate with stage and feet or a stage frequency curve. Again, it'll do stage and feet. So that will save you some time. You don't have to go over and select those each time, but you do still need to be aware of what your hazard type and units are to make sure that they're correct. So we start with our breach life loss for the daytime. We can simply copy and paste into total risk and we have our daytime curve. And then we can copy that function and rename it night for our breach life loss for the nighttime. And then we need to combine these into a composite function that we'll use in the risk analysis. So we right click on consequences and we are going to add a composite consequence. Call this breach life loss. And for our composite function, we're gonna add two rows to the consequence function table. First one will select breach life loss day, second one night, for our weights, we will assign our exposure percentages. For daytime, that's 0.42. And for nighttime, it's 0.58. And again, a bug in total risk, you'll see I have some errors down in the message window and my composite function isn't plotting. That can be remedied again by saving closing the file, and then reopening. When I do that, we have our composite life loss function for breach. <clears throat> okay, then we do the same thing for non-breach. We're using a PERT distribution. And we copy and paste. And then the same for the night. And then we add our composite function for non breach life loss. And we do the same thing that we did for the breach life loss. First consequence function is non-breach life loss day. Second is night. And then we can copy our weights from the breach life loss composite function. And then again, unfortunately, we have to save, close, and reopen. And we have our night non-breach life or our non-breach life loss composite curve. Our homework also gives us economic costs. So we will include that in this risk analysis as well. We're going to add another tabular consequence, breach economic loss. And for this one, we're not doing life loss in lives, but instead we need to select economic costs for our consequence and dollars for our consequence unit. 
We're going to use deterministic. We don't have any uncertainty in our economic cost data. So we simply copy and we paste. And we see our breach economic loss curve. We'll add another one for non-breach, and then we will be finished with consequences. Okay. Let me see one more time. We have a, a dummy error in the in the program. So as frustrating as it can be, it is a great piece of software, but like I said, still some bugs that were getting worked out. Okay. Now we have our hazard, we have our system response, and we have our consequences. The only thing that is left for us to do is to build our risk analysis. We add a risk analysis, and we'll call this one total project life loss. And we have our <coughs> risk analysis diagram here. The first thing we need to do is add our hazard. And then off of our hazard, we add our non-breach consequences. And then we have three failure modes, PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3. And each one of these failure modes need a corresponding consequence function. So we select our breach life loss composite function for each. So we see green lines between all of our functions, which means our risk analysis has been built correctly, all of our units match, and all the components that are necessary for a risk analysis are there. So the last thing that we need to do before we run it is to go to our options and make sure that everything is set up correctly with our Monte Carlo analysis. So we have a thousand iterations, which is what we want, and our failure mode method is set to common cause failures, which is what we want for this analysis. We can also do competing or joint failures, but for this one, we're using common cause. So now we can run with our mean risk or we can run with full uncertainty. Running with the mean risk, like we saw in our video, is pretty much instantaneous. And we can easily see where all of our failure modes and total plot. You can see summary st statistics for each one, the total, and then the marginal PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3 metrics. So simulating with mean risk is, is great. If you need something quick, you're just looking at it, maybe you're looking at it in the room during an elicitation, it gives you everything instantly. But you are asked to run with full uncertainty, so we'll go ahead and do that. And with a thousand iterations, this, this goes pretty quickly. When you get up to 10,000 iterations, it takes a little bit longer, more like five minutes or so, but that's miles faster than using QRA calcs. All right, so when we run with full uncertainty and go to our alpha eta plot or FN plot, we can see our total risk plotting position. And we can see the plotting position for each one of our individual potential failure modes as well. Then we can look at our summary statistics and see how well we're matching up with what you got in homework four. So if you have your results from homework four, you can compare and you should see that these are, are pretty close. Now I didn't check PFMs two and three to make sure I copied all my numbers over. So it's very possible I made some copy and paste error somewhere. So if these aren't exactly matching what you had for homework four, it may be my fault. When you have all your data pasted in correctly, all of these values should be pretty darn close to what you are seeing in RMC QRA calcs. Then we can also look at the big FN plot and we can look at our incremental risk. We can do that for the project total. We can look at each failure mode individually if we would like. We can look at our background or our non-breach risk for the project. 
and the total or residual. And we can also look at our diagnostics to get some of our other um, plots and things that we that we got from RMC QRA calcs. So this here is uh, annual probability of failure. We have our average annual life loss. So these are helpful tools and um, plots to let you see a little bit more about your risk calculation results. All right, we have one more risk analysis to build. Uh, Fernando, so homework four had intervention notes, so the answer should be different. The summary statistics, these metrics or these numbers should match the with intervention results that you got from homework four. So you're correct. If you wanted to see this, um, this risk analysis with and without intervention, you would need to create separate event trees for each one of your failure modes without that intervention node and then run two risk analyses, one with the without intervention node or PFMs and one with the with intervention event trees. But these values should match what you're getting for the with intervention risk analysis in homework four. Yeah, I'm, I'm comparing what I got for homework four and they're fairly close, but keep in mind one of the main differences is how we're defining the uncertainty and the hazard. So we did a, a PERT distribution using the ALT distribution in homework four where we defined the fifth the 50th and the 95th, whereas in this um, example for module five using total risk, we set the fifth and the 95th as the min and max for that distribution. So that's another cause for why the results are a little bit different. Yep. And I think there was a maybe a bug in the in the version of total risk that you all were using when you tried to do a per percentile or per percentile Z distribution, you got an error. Uh, that has been fixed, so you can, if you want to use the 5th, 50th, and 95th, and paste those in and compare the results to homework for, you can do that as well to see how well they match up. All right, and then our final risk analysis that we will run is for economic loss. So total project, economic loss. The diagram for this risk analysis is going to be structurally exactly the same as the one that we built for the life loss. The only difference here is when we add our consequences, we need to be sure to add our economic loss consequences and not our life loss consequences. So we still add responses for PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3. And when we have consequences in the event of a breach, we need breach economic loss. And then non-breach economic loss for our non-breach. Another thing that we need to do is come over to the properties window and make sure that our consequence unit is economic cost and dollars. <clears throat> and then once again, we check all the options. The options are all the same as they were for the first one, so we're good. And then we can run with full uncertainty here, but remember we don't have uncertainty for our economic loss. We do have uncertainty in stage frequency and we have uncertainty in our um, potential failure modes, but you won't see any uncertainty in the economic loss. So we can still run with full uncertainty and wait for it to go ahead and finish. And this one's running slow for some reason.
And for your reference, if you set up a model and you find that it's taking a long time to simulate like this one is, what I found is if you recreate the model in a new risk analysis, typically it won't take as long to run. I'm not sure why sometimes these analyses take a little bit longer to, to simulate, but if you were to make this one again in a new analysis, odds are that it would run more quickly. So our analysis is finished. Remember now we don't use the big or the little FN or alpha eta plot for economic cost. So we won't reference that. We'll be looking at the big FN plot. And you can see that something doesn't look quite right, right? We're going way off the page here. We're still showing life loss N and then a dollar sign, which is not correct. Part of the problem is when you set the tolerable risk limits to USACE, and then you click this checkbox to set your tolerable risk limit access extents. That will um, it will crop the plot at the limits of the tolerable risk limits that you have set. So the way to get around that is to simply go up to the drop down list and select none because there are no tolerable risk limits for economic cost, at least in the core. So once you do that, you see that um, you have your big FN plot for your economic cost for incremental. And then again, you can look at your background and your total. You can change the extents of your axes by right clicking and formatting. You can change the name of the axis. Pretty easily. Then you can also look at your summary statistics here. And bear in mind, it's still going to say conditional mean and mean e to the n. Um, just need to keep in mind that, that this is representative of dollars and not life loss for this scenario. All right, so that is homework five. Are there any questions? Questions about homework five, questions about total risk in general? a question about total risk um, and over the consequences uh, it's pretty straightforward but I don't think I'm making the connection of why it's called composite function when we're putting in the the uh, the day and night values mm -hmm. just wanted to know uh, like why those are called like that I think I'm missing that connection there. So these oh. composite functions are are what we're using when when you do the calculations manually in a spreadsheet. You have your day life loss and your night life loss, and then you have your weights for each one. Then you multiply your day life loss by the daytime weight. You multiply your night life loss by the nighttime weight, and then you add them together to get your gotcha. composite gotcha. life loss. That's what these composite functions are doing. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? A quick question. Um, in at risk, I use the function a lot where I, I put an output um, at different um, points in an event tree, or maybe there's a specific node where I want to evaluate um, or create an output for different flood levels. Um, how would you do that within at within a total risk? Or are you just looking? when you look at the results at a nodal level, like in that tabular output? So let me see if we can get to something here. So if you go into your event trees and you look at the diagnostics, mm -hmm. one thing that you can do is, let's see, got a couple of different options that you can use here. When you go into the diagnostics and you select Monte Carlo iterations and hazard level, essentially what it's doing is it's it's running that full Monte Carlo analysis for each node 
at whatever hazard level you're specifying. So in this case, when we're looking at event likelihood, what we're seeing here is at hazard level 574.3, this is the range of results for node one. So for node one, you know, you have your median value, your 75th percentile, 25th percentile. Um, and I think this is 5th percent and 95th percent here. So you can see that that data on a nodal level in the diagnostics tab. Is that right. what you're looking for or are you looking for something different? Yeah, I just didn't know if there was a way to create something like this, this box and whiskers plot for across multiple hazard levels. Across multiple hazard levels, I don't know that there is. I'm thinking the only the only way you could do that would be to separate whatever node you're interested in out into its own event tree. Yeah. And then run a risk analysis just for that node. And then okay. that but that's that's gonna that's gonna roll. I mean, you're if you're setting outputs just on the on the nodal probabilities, you're only looking for uncertainty and outputs just for that node, right? You're not interested in the outputs for the hazard or the consequences. So, I might look at that diagnostics tab and see if you can find what you're looking for. Okay, thank you. All right, Damon, I'll throw it back to you. Very good. So if no one has any questions, I see in the chat asking for the password for the quiz. So the, the buzzword for this module is going to be continuous. The buzzword for this module is going to be continuous. Um, past that, just like we've been doing to get um, credit for attending this session or viewing the video, you missed the session. Again, the quiz will be from uh, will be done in Socrative. The room name is shown there on the screen. So for this one, it's going to be DLS 105 R5, and then you'll enter your name like we've been doing. Uh, this this quiz will be really simple. It's just the buzzword for this one, so that shouldn't take you any time to complete and get your credit. Um, past that, in the coming week or two. Um, we're going to be sending out an email that has all the uh, credit summarized in a spreadsheet. So, you know, the credit for all, completing the homeworks and the quizzes. So I'd ask that you take a look at that when you get it and double check and make sure that our records match your records. And if there's anything that um, we didn't give you credit for that you feel like you should get credit, uh, send us an email and we'll double check and make sure that that's all correct. Um, past that, all the Module 6 files and video should be posted on the website, and we should be all set for that last and final module. So we should have a uh, few weeks for you to get through that video and to complete the homework, and then that'll be a wrap on the quiz, or wrap on the course, until we get to the final exam at the very, very end. So if um, nobody has any other questions, that'll be the, this will be the end of the live Q&A, and we'll catch you for office hours here in a couple weeks. Hey, Damon, I do have a um, quick question. Not on the program, sure. but on the, the life loss plot that we use in this homework. Um, it drops at a certain stage. It climbs and then it yeah. drops. What's the physical reason? So that's going to be once we've exceeded the threshold for top of active storage. So your, your worst case consequence scenario is often going to be when we've got water up to top of active storage and a breach that occurs at that level. Once you start to get above a fair amount of the downstream population at risk is going to be warned just for the non-breach releases already. So there's going to be a heightened awareness downstream. People are going to be moved out of the way because they're already going to get wet by, you know, some amount of spillway flow. And then when you add a breach warning on top of that, you're getting multiple warnings. So more people should be out of the way. And then it'll increase from there because 
the depth of inundation will typically increase with the higher stages. Okay. Does that make that's sense? What I think it, it does, and that's what I was wondering if that's the case, but it, it's such a dramatic change on those plots, I just want yeah, to confirm. Yeah, that one is fairly dramatic. Um, again, keep in mind, we kind of made up those numbers just for the example, but um, other ones might not be quite as pronounced, but that trend is fairly typical. All right, well, thanks for participating in the Module 5 Live Q&A, and we'll catch you back in a couple weeks.